Hello and welcome to York Universe, the astronomy and astrophysics program written and presented by students, faculty, alumni, and friends of York University. I'll be one of your hosts this evening. I'm Dr. Elena Hyde, and I'm joined tonight by a very special guest, Professor Mary Helen Armour from York University. I'll tell you more about her in just a second, but to start off our morning, our evening, sorry, this is definitely evening. We're broadcasting live from LNA Carswell Observatory located at York University in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. This is Science Night in Canada on uh, astronomy.fm, but unfortunately this broadcast is not there tonight. We are um, broadcasting separately, but we are still in partnership with astronomy.fm um, and we look forward to rejoining them once they go live again. York Universe broadcasts every Monday night at 9 p.m. local Toronto time or uh, Tuesday morning at about 2 a.m. in UT, if that's more your speed. This broadcast is actually going at the same time as our online public viewing. So if you have um, joined us from another place or if you are... Um, you know, watching this later, perhaps, you can always go back to YouTube and see online public viewing by getting to our website, www.yorku.ca slash science slash observatory. If you follow the links to OPV or click on any link on our website that says YouTube, and it'll take you back to the online public viewing channel where we also do, of course, our teletubes. Since we are in partnership with Astronomy.fm, the voice of astronomy, you can always find our episodes archived there. And if you have any questions or comments for past shows or ideas for future topics, send us an email at observe at yorku.ca. You can also find us on Twitter at York Observatory or York Universe, and on Instagram at York U Observatory, and Facebook at LNA Carswell OBS. All of our programs are free, but if you'd like to make a donation, you can see that website I mentioned before, yorku.ca slash science slash observatory. Our crew is monitoring the chat room on YouTube for questions right now, if you're listening live, that is, posting comments and showing some archived images because the weather is, gosh, pretty terrible in uh, Toronto right now. <laughs> so we have been suffering very, very poorly from the, uh, the clouds. Um, and I'll just go ahead and introduce our special guest for the show tonight. Uh, Professor Mary Helen Armour uh, is a faculty at York University. If you haven't seen her around um, the observatory, she actually teaches a number of science courses in the Natural Sciences Division, but she was recently our Astronomer in Residence. So you'll find her at the Alan A. Carswell Observatory Astronomer in Residence blog from earlier this summer. And she has a huge range of interest in astronomy topics from historical uh, and how the sky was used as a, a calendar to planetary sciences, finding life somewhere other than Earth, and asteroid impact structures, which is going to have a special, uh, a special, I suppose, conjunction with the uh, the topics for tonight. Um, she's done lots of astronomy-related geology talks, and I very much look forward to having her on. So, welcome, Mary Helen. Thank you. <laughs> so, how are these guys where you are? Uh, well, a little hazy and overcast, but I'm a little up north of Toronto, so I don't think it's quite as bad up here as down there. Uh, I'm also lucky that I'm far enough north that the light pollution isn't bad, so I can actually do some observing from my back deck, so. <laughs> oh, excellent, excellent. Well, of course, so I'm, as, I'm as we know, it's, uh, yeah, light pollution is a huge issue, and if you can get out of the city, that's great. I mean, the haze is still bad, though. Well, yeah. So that's 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 not great, but uh, it it that was what was so nice about being up at Killarney is they have like no electric lights, no nothing. So at night it is really dark. <laughs> yeah, and they do very carefully protect their status as a dark sky preserve up there. Um, so uh, one of the things we always like to encourage people about is if you do get a chance to to hood your lights and um, use sort of. Uh, um, uh, mitigation techniques on on the lights that you need to have uh, you can actually get much much better sky quality brightness and it's actually very good for the local wildlife as well which is what I learned last time I went up there <laughs> yeah the wildlife oh. gets confused by artificial lights 
Yes, yes, exactly. All this artificial lights making us stay awake late at night. Wait, no, uh, but we would do, probably do that anyways here, looking at telescopes all the time. Um, wait, who knows? Maybe it will clear and we'll be able to open up. But for now, our wonderful crew is showing some beautiful archive images over on online public viewing. So make sure to tune into those and ask some questions in the YouTube chat as the show goes today. So usually for this uh, this broadcast, we tend to start off with a little bit of this week in space and astronomy history. So I thought it would be fun, given the recent uh, landing, uh, which we're going to talk more about, of the Bennu sample on Earth. Uh, for this week in space and astronomy history, I'm actually just going to go back to 1999, which is a, an interesting year. <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, yes, as far as years ago, this was a very interesting one. Uh, but in more ways than one. 22nd September uh, 1999, um, I believe it was 22nd September, there was a close pass by of Earth by an unknown object uh, that had yet to be named properly. Um, it was first observed on September 11th 1999 with a one meter telescope of all things. As you know, we also have a one meter telescope, but it wasn't here in 1999. Um, and they, uh, they since have named that object, uh, which it was found to be an asteroid, Bennu. And they tracked it from September 11th all the way through, uh, measured it as much as they possibly could, collected data through radar imaging, um, and really watched it as closely as possible. Um, by the 22nd of September in 1999, Bennu passed 0 0.0147 AU from Earth. So just as a little bit of astronomy distance calculations, um, if you haven't heard of an AU, that's one astronomical unit. Uh, so if you're trying to convert between astronomical units and uh, sort of Earth distances, well, one astronomical unit is the distance from the Earth all the way to the Sun. So even a small sounding number like 0 0.0147 astronomical units is actually um, millions of kilometers, about 2 million kilometers. Um, to be slightly more precise, which is much, much farther than, of course, um, the moon or anything else. So it passed close by, but not that close. But it was still interesting because we we don't have a lot of other things in orbit around around Earth. I mean, we have Earth and our moon, but there wasn't a lot known. And we're, we're getting better at spotting, of course, uh, smaller asteroids and objects in space. But finding asteroids and tracking asteroids has been an ongoing project, um, mapping where they are. There's not a lot of them around Earth's orbit. Most of them are out in the asteroid belt. So um, this initial discovery back in 1999 uh, was done, as I say, with a one meter telescope. It was done just south of the border, so down in New Mexico in the US. And uh, this was actually during a survey. So hooray for surveys, the Lincoln Laboratory Near Earth Research or LINEAR survey. Um, so they, they did get it uh, initially when it was about 0 0.05 astronomical units. So uh, this is again, millions of miles um, and uh, about 20 times the distance from the earth to the moon. So very far away, but in terms of space, um, this is what they call a close approach. So um, one astronomical unit for anyone who's trying to actually follow the conversions is about 93 million miles. So we had this uh, sort of close approach and we had it coming from 0 0.05 to 0 0.0147 and the orbit was starting to be mapped. So we use something called radar. Uh, they also had uh, ranging with radio telescopes and spectroscopy, which is used uh, by, we've talked about this a couple of times on this show, but that's basically when you sort of split the light up and look at emission from individual kinds of uh, chemicals. So we could find out what's in it by looking at the kind of light it reflects. So obviously this was a really interesting object because it was new and somewhat close. I mean, for an outer space thing, this was pretty close. And uh, from 2005 to 2007, it actually approached Earth again. So we started to learn about its orbit. And its orbit, if you've seen any pictures online, it actually is somewhat uh, 
Earth adjacent. So there's a there's a region where it actually comes very close to Earth's orbit, and it also goes around the sun. So from 2005 to 2007, we had it come back again, and a whole bunch of places started looking at it. So we had ground-based telescopes, space-based telescopes, everybody was observing Bennu. And NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope measured the temperature and brightness in 2008. We had Hubble observing it um, as well as Spitzer. We had the European Space Agency's Herschel Space Observatory observing it. So many, many ground-based observatories focused on Bennu again and again as it, um, as it kept coming around and having more close approaches to Earth. Um, and a lot of these observations helped people refine what was going on. They kind of were able to tell a little bit about its rotation and its shape. And they used radio observations from 2011, uh, as well as 2005 and 1999 to all map for speeds and distances for Bennu at various times. So one fun thing, of course, that we can tie in to our own local uh, York, uh, LNI Carswell Observatory is now that we have a one meter telescope, Bennu is actually one of the objects that we can track as well, uh, which is a very fun, um, I think, very fun student project. <laughs> so um, the Bennu asteroid was found to make one full orbit around the sun every 1.2 years. Its trajectory means that it comes close to Earth, I mean, for, for outer space, close, not actually close, every six years. So observations from 1999 to 2000 and 2005 to, uh, to six were really um, valuable because Bennu was so close. There won't be another close approach to Earth until 2060. Um, according to the models we have now. And it's worth mentioning as well that Bennu is, we talk about an asteroid, um, how, how big is it? Well, it's uh, bigger than the Eiffel Tower or the Empire State Building, but in terms of actual size, we think it's around, um, so Bennu is something like 500 meters, 560 meters by 500 meters by 500 meters. And it's not a square. It actually looks kind of like a rotating top or a very, very dusty, smoothed off diamond. <laughs> um, it's It's got a very kind of a diamondy top shape and it's not round because it doesn't have enough mass to make itself round, but it's still large enough to where it could cause, um, uh, you know, pop substantial, shall I say, problems if it was to, if it was to impact Earth. Um, now it doesn't have a lot of dust coming up, but we thought maybe it might be very um, low density. Uh, the the gravitational effects of Bennu show that it's actually, despite being a rocky object, it's only slightly denser than water. So either it's very low dense rocks or there might be some water in there, which is one of the things back in 1999 that really made people want to go and investigate it more. <laughs> so um, this week in space and astronomy history back in 1999 was when the adventure really started for Bennu. So Mary <laughs> Helen, do you, do, you, uh, do you remember when this came out? <sighs> I think I, to some extent, yes, but I didn't, it didn't, it, um, at the time they didn't call it Bennu. I mean, the name came along later, originally it was 1999 and uh, letter and number by its discovery. So uh, I didn't put together until much later that this is actually the same thing. Yeah, 1999 RQ36. Yeah. Um, when, when was it actually named Bennu? That's one of the things I was wondering. It, it got renamed, obviously, it's once not, they realized it was important. Yeah, so it had to be, I'm guessing that it would have to be the second time it came around. I mean, the first time it flies by, they wouldn't have they wouldn't have thought about oh, it. Oh yeah, here it is. It's um so so we've talked before about the dangers of having contests to name things. <laughs> but Bennu was actually selected by a name that asteroid contest run by the University of Arizona in 2012. Yeah. Uh which is very recent actually. <laughs> so it didn't end up being called Asteroid McAsteroidy Face, but um yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's uh it, so it was actually uh 1999 rq36 for many many years years yeah 
And if you if you don't make the connection, because it's like, okay, you followed the first time or so, and then you don't make the connection when they've renamed it, it's sort of like, oh, Bennu, oh, something new. And then you realize, no, actually, it used to be. It used to have that. But I mean, a, a lot of that's how asteroids are named when they're first um, discovered. I mean, it, when you talk about the, the other the other sort of recent big discovery one was, of course, Erica. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Um, yes, yes, exactly. Flew by. And for the longest time, it's like coming up to it, I always kind of knew it by its, you know, uh, discovery sort of name and title. And then all of a sudden it's like, Arakoff, what's that? Oh, yes, that's right. They renamed it. Yeah, and I believe that one originally had a really catchy, like, numerical, um, numerical string name as well. Um, and of course, you know, you don't give them uh, really good names until they get interesting. So if it's yeah. not an interesting object, you let it stay as, you know, um, so here's Erikoth, uh 11101131Y. <laughs> um, yeah, I think Erikoth is a little, little catchier. <laughs> um, but yeah, you're exactly right. And that's, of yeah. course, um, Asteroid Naming Convention. Yeah, and, and it was funny because briefly for a while when they st- when they first sort of sort of unofficially named it, they called it Ultima Thule. So it got very confusing. Like, what are you guys doing? Oh yeah, mul- multiple renames, and this is why you always yeah. check your check your astronomical catalogs carefully, because you could have the same object under three, four, five different names. Um, oh yeah, it's always worth uh, always worth investigating. So. Um, all right, so yeah. I have one more fun uh, this week in space and astronomy history that I thought would be kind of a, uh, a little bit of a different look at Bennu. Um, so usually I for history, we do historical things, uh, 1999 being a thing that has already happened. But because Bennu is such an interesting object, I thought I would break with tradition and put a potential <laughs> this week in space and astronomy <laughs> history for the 24th of September, 2182. Um, so I will be a hundred and something at this time. <laughs> so <laughs> um, <laughs> like, wow, I'll, I'll be like 200 and something by this time. Um, so for sure. So 2182. Um, and the reason why I want to go all the way forward to 2182 is this is currently thought to be the, the um, sort of point where Bennu has a cumulative chance of impacting Earth that is not um, really small. So due to Bennu's orbit, we're not particularly worried about it hitting us in the next 20 years or maybe even 50 years, 60 years, uh, maybe. And so the risk goes up because we get more uncertainty. The models of the orbit become less uh, less certain. And Bennu is not in what's called a stable orbit. So it does actually have fluctuations every time it goes around, which means it could fluctuate closer to Earth. And if it gets too close, Earth's gravity will pull it in. I mean, it might pull it into our moon, which would be interesting in a different way. Uh, but um, the the cumulative chance goes up to the point where it's what we would what what some scientists are calling a appreciable risk. So by the year 2182, right now, again, with modeling, we think this would be a one in 1,750 chance of impacting Earth. So not a huge chance. I mean, nothing to bet, you know, a lot of money on. But with the size of Bennu, um, it is something we definitely want to consider. So between 2178 and 2290, um, far, far into the future for a lot of us, um, that is, uh, you know, a chance of Earth being impacted by a fairly massive object. Currently, models say the greatest risk of Im- being impacted is on 24 September 2182. So that's why I had to put that up. <laughs> um, it is it is far into the future and the orbit is not stable. So it could do a lot of things. Maybe some other, maybe a comet flies by in the meantime that we haven't seen and it actually does something totally different. Uh, We don't really know, but 
with the modeling and the size of Bennu. Um, so as I say, it's it's uh, 500 by, well, 560 by 500 and some by 500 di- uh, meters in dimensions. And its mass is on the order of 10 to the 10 kilograms, which is pretty hefty. So if this thing that is you know larger than the Empire State Building and larger than the Eiffel Tower came down, um, there are pictures of it that people have done to scale over New York City, and it actually does look like those asteroid disaster movie pictures <laughs> because <laughs> it it is large enough that it would um, it would create a substantial substantial impact. And so, uh, Mary Helen, this is where I'd like to refer yeah. to your expertise. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, something in that sort of 500 meter range, you're starting to get up to, and it's not just the size of the crater. I mean, you're getting up, you know, you're getting up into a crater tens of kilometer, if not into that hundred kilometer range for something that size. I mean, you're getting, you're getting maybe not quite as big as dinosaur extinction, but up in that kind of range. Um I mean, it would have some pretty, that would have like global climactic effects. That's not just a big, the big hole in the ground is the least of your worries. The bigger problem is something like that. If it hits, how much uh, dust and water it throws up in the atmosphere, because in, in, in sort of looking at asteroid impacts, they actually describe something called impact winter. And they figure that's what killed the dinosaurs is when that particular asteroid hit it threw so much sort of dust and volatiles and everything up in the atmosphere that it basically uh, sent the earth into a very sudden ice age, right? And they refer to that as impact winter. And for those of you who are listening, who may be old enough to remember the sort of term nuclear winter, it's the exact same idea. You just put so much material up into the stratosphere in particular that you block out the sun for long periods of time. And it can take decades, you know, centuries, even for something really big, potentially millennia for all of this to filter back down to ground. So it can have some pretty significant like, global climate effects and, and sort of we see this on a very, very small scale, sometimes even with volcanic eruptions, that they throw enough gas and dust up in the air. But this would be sort of whole order of magnitude bigger. Now, the one thing, though, is that whenever you talk about an impact, the density of the object does make a difference. Yeah. So the fact that Bennu is not that dense um, would be a point in your favor. But it's also, it, it's it's so complicated to figure out like exactly how much damage it do because you have to look at how dense it is. You'd have to look at exactly the angle it hit at. Um, something that's, the density in that is so low I, it might be an interesting one to model because most of the models we do for impacts on Earth, we talk in average densities of rock. So you're generally looking at at least twice the density of, of you know, at, at 1.5 grams per centimeter squared, your typical rock is getting close to twice that. So it's also a really interesting question as to, you know, what would happen to an asteroid that size? Yeah, and as, as you um, say, especially with all that with all that evaporation that could occur, if it was a lot of water, I mean, one thing that I saw um, in some of the publications was that, you know, this might actually be worse because it would all evaporate and it would all go into the atmosphere. Oh yeah, um, and it, that that again would have all kinds of weird climate effect and the problem is not so much when it ends up in the lower atmosphere is when it gets up in the stratosphere because of the stability of that layer of the atmosphere it will hang there for decades or centuries or more and create an absolute sort of a massive sunblock um that would really cool the planet down so well i mean but i don't know that that cooling the planet down is so such a bad idea at the moment but this is not how we'd want to do it for sure yeah, no. um, <laughs> i uh, i know that if you just look at the rock part of it um the uh, the kinetic energy if you take the mass of that asteroid and the mass of earth and collide them uh they expect it to be something like uh a 1200 megaton explosion um and if you, the you know as you say this is such an incredibly large explosion compared to anything else um you know on the order of you know maybe not as large as what what got rid of the dinosaurs but right on that order um 
for comparison, the most powerful nuclear weapon ever tested was 54 megatons. And so this is 1,200 at least. Um, and that's not even including that we don't, we don't fully understand uh, what it's made up of and how it will react with us if it does hit us. Yeah, it's just like it's not in in the case of an impact. It's not just the kinetic energy, but you have all that mass involved too. But the thing is, these things will have so much kinetic energy that they actually evaporate entirely on impact. Like if you go to impact craters for sort of those larger ones, when you start to get serious craters, there's nothing left of the actual asteroid that came in because the sheer amount of energy released literally vaporizes it and spreads it all over the place <laughs> that's actually one of the reasons they actually first found the dinosaur crater is because the iridium which you don't find on earth was found in this sort of thin layer right above where the dinosaurs went extinct in the geology so uh, whether Bennu would create quite that level mm, probably not but if you want to look in terms of comparison if you know the um the behringer meteor crater uh, is about a kilometer and a half across. And I think the asteroid that created that one was probably in the 90 meter range. So, you know, less than 20% of what Bennu is. Now that one they think was more iron, so much more dense. But, you know, for, for comparison, if you can take something that's, you know, less 90 meters or so across and dig out a whole 1.5 kilometers across, you know, now multiply that by a factor of of five at least if not more because it's not just the size it's also the mass you're talking about pretty big hole in the ground <laughs> yeah well and of course um we can't discuss holes in the ground uh, too much without at least mentioning if you are in ontario canada uh you do have of course the sudbury basin <laughs> Yeah. Um, and if you've ever seen it on, on Google Maps, even just looking at your um, your Google Maps zoomed all the way out or a NASA satellite image of, Sud of the Sudbury Basin area, you can already get the idea that this is a very, very, very large structure. <laughs> um, and that was, I think, do, do they know if it was a comet or an asteroid yet? Uh, I'm not sure if that's ever quite been decided. It could be very hard to tell. I mean, pretty much the difference between a comet and an asteroid is one has started to melt the tail off and the other one's more rocky without those ices. I mean, so it can be, you know, challenging to tell. And the problem is the crater itself is, is rather degraded because, of course, since that hit, you had all kinds of mountain buildings. So now the crater isn't quite round anymore either. So, yeah, it sort of looks like, I don't know, like an axe head to me on the Google map thing, like an outline of a, the head of an axe. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's almost like elliptical because it's been squished by all the mountain building. Um, and the, yeah, and of course, that, that's why we don't see a lot of these craters on Earth is our planet just keeps erasing them with the activity. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, but I mean, even, even if you look at images of Bennu, even it will have pockmarks all over the surface because everything in the solar system gets hit. It's just a question of whether it gets erased later or not. I mean, if you look at the moon, you can see all the craters there. The moon yeah, yeah. Any more than Earth. It's just all the, it doesn't have any geology and, and atmosphere and everything to erase them. So. Well, and actually, of course, uh, impacts, uh, this being an impact danger, um, I do have to mention as, as part of my, my future scenario here, um, <laughs> going back to in the future, this might be a danger to us as an impact, but we did recently have a very successful double asteroid redirection test or DART. So if you missed that, um, the DART mission was actually a plan where they had a, a spacecraft um, successfully collide last year. And I have to say this very carefully. Yeah. This is 2023. Just, just last year. We've had so much crazy stuff happening in astronomy. This is amazing. It collided with Dimorphos. Um, so Dimorphos was a minor planet moon of the asteroid Didymos. So Dimorphos... Uh, is quite a bit smaller than something like um, Bennu, 
but um, the asteroid, so this is a binary system, the asteroid Didymos was actually kind of Bennu adjacent, as I recall, um, sort of the similar size. Um, so I believe that it was, uh, was it 800 by 800 by 600 or something um, yeah. in, in meters for its classification. So even a little bit larger than Bennu. And because they deflected a, um, it's, it's, mo it's asteroid lit. <laughs> I'm not sure how you call the, 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 the smaller body that was orbiting it. They hit it with their spacecraft. And that was literally the plan. We're going to deflect uh, this by, by running into it as fast as we can with our spacecraft and smack it. And it actually worked <laughs> and they actually did a momentum transfer and they've been studying it ever since. Um, so they've been watching how its orbit changed and by even this little satellite impacting um, the dimorphos Didymos pair, it let off a huge stream of uh, plumes of dust and debris blasted off the surface and they actually did manage to change um, the 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 orbital parameters of that object, um, and it's it's obviously far enough away that we do not have to worry about it. Um, it was sort of, I believe, selected for that reason. Yeah. Um, but it is it is actually possible, and so knowing what we know now and having a successful test just last year, as long as we keep funding things like DART, um, if Bennu does become a threat, maybe by then we'll be able to actually directly deflect even larger asteroids and be able to to do something about a Bennu class uh, uh, potential impact. Oh yeah, I mean it, it, the 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 uh, the near Earth orbit objects have been of concern for quite a while. When they started to realize um, there aren't a huge number of them, but there are enough of them out there, uh, and you know we've had close calls. I mean. If you know anything about um, the Tunga uh, Tunguska Tung incident, yes, I always the get, I've Tung always, I Tunguska, yes, yeah. yes, yeah, that that hit Siberia uh, early in the twentieth century. In some ways, it's like I said, they were very lucky it hit somewhere that un 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 uninhabited. Um, because had it hit even, they figured 10 or 15 minutes earlier, it may have crashed into sort of Moscow and some of those major population areas. And then you would have been talking about um, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of casualties. So we have been hit. And um, in the case of Tunguska, they figure it was an air explosion that it didn't actually make it to the surface, but it did sort of detonate above the surface, but it was still enough to literally knock down trees and have destruction for like hundreds of kilometers around the, yeah. the, the air burst. And that's yeah, a pretty close. Um, that's two, pretty 2000, close. over 2000 square kilometers. Yeah. Um, and a, that's, that was back all the way back for, you know, this is a good history item for those folks who are interested. This was all the way back in 1908. Um, so it's, it's, we don't have good records before then, um, but this is the best, I think, large impact that we have. Um, we have good sort of modern records for, um, and it was, it was quite, quite the thing. Uh, no impact crater. No, it was, it was an air burst. So they figured, um, and they've done similar things with, with other explosions. So they know how this works and you just get a huge sort of downdraft and then out and it knocks all the trees over it still would have, had there been any structures on it, just totally eliminated. But where it hit out in Siberia, they don't know if they're even, I'm not even sure there ever were any casualties. That's how uninhabited the area was. I mean, part of the, the problem with studying it was, of course, they couldn't get out there right away because in 1908 in Russia. <laughs> um, yeah, there were things <laughs> happening, yes. <laughs> yes, things were happening. So they, they did not get out to actually observe until years later. But even at the time, um, it set off side and other reports worldwide just because of the energy of this thing. And this is like, you know, early 20th century technology, which probably was not nearly as sensitive as what we have now. Oh, yeah. And there were there were expeditions. So this was that was 1908 that it happened. But there were expeditions in, in the 1920s and 1930s and 1940s. Yeah. Um, and there are recorded 
uh, reports um, from people. Um, and I believe there, there were, uh, there were some people who went missing, um, but um, I don't, as you say, I, I'm not sure that they recorded actual casualties from the event, despite the fact that it was absolutely huge, covering a giant region of, of uh, trees and, yeah. um, you know, having this massive, massive blast pattern um, where, you know, just the trees were flattened for for you know, many, many, many kilometers in every direction. <laughs> Thousands of kilometers, literally 2,000 something square kilometers. Um, oh, yeah. So, you know, of course, it, when they, their only pictures that we have are, um, are, I think, the 1920s and 1930s pictures, but you can still see just a devastation even decades okay. later. The flattened, um, the flattened forests were just yeah. like. Yeah, and I, I found it. There's three. There were three reported missing people uh, from this event. Um, yeah. Whereas, it, it, and it's like I said, they calculated if it had been, you know, a few minutes earlier, a few hours earlier yeah. that it came by, there were like some major population centers it could have hit. So that was a pretty close call. And it's like I said, I don't know if they still call it that, but. Over the last few decades, of course, NASA and other groups have initiated Space Watch, um, which yes. is meant to look for these things to to uh, to try and find them. Now, they can be tricky. I mean, something like Bennu, if you, if you look at its composition, it's a C-type asteroid, and they're actually some of the harder ones to find because the ones with that much sort of carbon and stuff on them don't don't reflect light that much. So they are they are very dark and they're very hard to see. <laughs> So and it's very lucky that this one came close when it did, um, and we could uh, we could start monitoring it. And of course, if you are interested in watching its um, its orbit, there are a lot of lovely models out there, um, animations showing what we think will happen based on the laws of gravity and what we know of the orbit so far. And what you'll see right away is if you start tracing the orbit of Bennu now, it it goes around. Uh, it goes around uh, the sun, but it does loop de loops. It actually, um, it actually does almost have, um, you know, some sort of little curly, strange behavior. Um, oh shoot! I just forgot the word. Uh, what were those little uh, cycles that they used to think that the planets had instead of going around the sun? Oh, the God, epicycles. Epicycles. Yeah. Yes, that's the word I was searching for. I'm like, astronomy trivia moment. So it, there are no <laughs> epicycles on our planets because they go around the sun. But Bennu actually does ha look like it gets epicycles because it does, it goes around and then it does little curlies and then it goes around again. And that's not because it has actual epicycles. It, it just looks that way. But it's actually unstable. It's an unstable orbit. And that's what happens when you plug the laws of gravity into an unstable system so um it is it is really really interesting stuff but i think uh this is about the point where i do have to remind everyone you are in fact listening to york universe broadcasting live from alan i carswell observatory located at york university in toronto ontario canada you can always see our website yorku.ca slash science slash observatory for chat questions content uh, or of course on Twitter at York Universe or York U Observatory. Tonight you are listening to Dr. Alina Hyde and Professor Mary Helen Armour and we're discussing well Bennu, orbits, impacts and all kinds of great stuff. So uh, <laughs> if you'd like to um, find out more about our OPV sessions or see any archived OPV issues you can go back to that website and click on any YouTube link to get to our OPV channel or playlist, I should say, on YouTube. Um, all right, so that's our little reminder. And we do actually have one extra reminder for this week. Uh, if you missed the announcement last week, um, well, I have some good news for you. The weekly observatory tours are back. Um, that's right, we had our grand reopening. The observatory is back in business for in-person weekly Wednesday tours, either at our atrium location 
location on the Arboretum parking garage or in the observatory proper, which is through the Petrie Science and Engineering Building. So if you get your Eventbrite tickets, make sure to check which location they say on them because they're two different buildings. This week we are at the atrium, which is on top of the Arboretum parking garage. So fingers crossed that the weather on Wednesday is a little bit better than what we're seeing uh, tonight. All right, so that's our our, our reminders. <laughs> um, and this is the part where we get to our news item. So unsurprisingly, our news item is Bennu related because on Sunday, oh my gosh, an asteroid sample returned to Earth. And that, that means actual material from an asteroid and not just any asteroid, it was Bennu. Um, it was super exciting. So a bunch of us were watching the NASA live stream on Sunday and you see the capsule, uh, well, the animation of the capsule coming through. And then they they had the capsule actually land just south of the border uh, down in Utah, I believe. And um, as soon as it landed, everybody was scrambling, trying to figure out where it was. And so they had uh, people on the ground and they had helicopters there. And as soon as they got confirmation of the landing, you could actually see on the live stream, everybody running off to the helicopters, chasing it down. And they found the <laughs> capsule, I think within 25 or 30 minutes max, they were actually yeah. able to uh, to find it. And, and then, of course, they had a very special team who came in to retrieve the sample from Bennu. And this was all happening yesterday. <laughs> you can believe it. <laughs> like, was that yesterday? It seems like more than more than a day has passed. It's just been that much excited, excitement. So this was sample return from Bennu. And it's thanks to the OSIRIS-REx mission. So if you haven't heard of OSIRIS-REx, this is the part of the show where I have to tell you about it. Um, because uh, OSIRIS-REx was a mission that um, basically came about as a result of all this uh, all this history that I've been talking to you about. So it was launched all the way back in 2016, um, and it was launched from Cape Canaveral, and it had a sample return capsule, and it had a, um, a main sort of spacecraft. So the OSIRIS-REx uh, as I've said before, I just love that they've called it Rex and its job was to go and fetch a sample um, and bring it back to us. <laughs> and it did. So it's a very good spacecraft. And um, it actually was was designed to conduct um, close proximity, in-depth studies of, of asteroids. And so its primary mission was to collect samples from Bennu. Um, which is, you know, carbonaceous near-Earth asteroid, uh, lots of interesting properties. Um, now, it does have more missions to go to. So not only did this spacecraft go to Bennu, uh, conduct wonderful studies on Bennu, uh, map the surface of Bennu, get a sample from Bennu, brought the sample back to Earth, dropped it in Earth's atmosphere, and then the spacecraft kept going. <laughs> So it's actually still um, in progress, doing wonderful things on its way out to asteroid. Um, uh, this is one of the number ones, 99942. No, it, has, it, has, it has a name now. Oh, it has a name? A, 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 a Apophis? Apophis. Okay, so 99942 slash Apophis. Yeah, it's another, this one's a little further out but it's you know aimed as a second one i think they've officially changed the name now it's not osiris rex it's osiris oh i can't remember i was reading it earlier on the nasa page but they've oh changed, it's they've, apex they've, it's yeah apex. they've changed yeah. apex yeah they've Cause changed because it's going to apophis yeah so this is going the, to a different asteroid now. Yeah, that, that makes sense the fetching part happened so rex is done um now it's apex yeah, <laughs> uh, but it's a wonderful, a wonderful space mission, and it's it's actually got a lot of great um, sort of Canadian overlap as well, which we we always love to see. Um, it had uh, a huge amount of different instrumentation on board, um, and you know the the mission itself has been ongoing, let's say, since twenty twenty sixteen, um, and it's 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 still going, which is great. And it's got an extended mission now, but it has so many instruments for uh, measuring um, and helping to characterize 
these interesting asteroids. Um, so it's got cameras, it's got spectrometers, so that's what helps to map what kinds of minerals and organic substances might be on the asteroid surface. Um, it's got thermal uh, emission spectrometer, so you get um, maps about uh, infrared um, infrared changing and um, X-ray imaging spectrometer. And it's, of course, the one I have to mention is um, the OSIRIS-REx, or I guess uh, OSIRIS-APEX <laughs> laser altimeter, um, OLA. So that is a scanning LIDAR instrument, and that has a unique uh, overlap with York University because, of course, um, LIDAR and York University go hand in hand. Um, our own Allen I. Carswell Observatory um, being connected through Allen I. Carswell directly to LIDAR. But the lead instrument scientist of the OLA for OSIRIS, um, I guess it's still probably OSIRIS Rex. I'm going to get this confused for the rest of the episode. Um, so the lead instrument scientist is um, Dr. Michael Daly from York University. So again, we get to we get to come back to York University and we can we can watch Bennu um, with our with our one meter telescope and uh, be very, very excited about the science all around. Um, the sample return system was actually called the Touch and Go uh, Sample Acquisition Mechanism. Uh, and it's also got an acronym TAGSAM. I, I'm guessing they didn't <laughs> change the acronym for that. But it could only do one sample. Um, so they can't sample any other asteroids. Um, but uh, the one asteroid that they did sample is still really, really, really exciting. And the fact that it worked so well um, as just a, a a satellite mission. It's just been it's just been astonishing. Um, so massive, massive props to Osiris Rex. For <laughs> as you said, it's 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 only a small sample. I mean, that's what people you know have to realize. It only brought back like about two hundred and fifty grams. But yep, with the small sample size, you need to do sort of chemical and geological analysis. That is a lot. Um, I mean, the the thing that you know I found fascinating is as quickly as they scooped it up, they took it immediately to a clean room. So there was yes. no chance of earth contamination because that was their biggest worry. That once you crack this thing open, if you were looking at some of these molecules that you know have been in space for four and a half billion years, the last thing you want <laughs> is to crack it open and all of a sudden become contaminated with like earth chemicals. So yeah, and all of the, uh, the updates from today um, have been the capsule's uh, subsequent travel from very, very clean room to other very, very clean room. <laughs> so um, basically, they, uh, as of today, earlier today, uh, the sample went to NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, um, which has its own clean room. So it actually landed at um, another clean room first. I forget which what the first one was as a staging area and then it went it was very very carefully packaged went to nasa's johnson space center in houston um, and that's where it's kind of being curated is what they're calling it but very carefully dealt with um and portioned out and canada will get some i believe we get four <laughs> percent <laughs> um but we get it's our parcel, own it's parceled up the way telescope time is but just yeah not... <laughs> Um, oh, and, put in? Okay, you get this many telescope hours, yeah. You get this many grams of uh, of, of asteroid bits. Um, and so we get a percentage of, of whatever is in there. Uh, and that actually is going to be um, uh, set to arrive at the CSA headquarters, um, the John H. Chapman Space Center. Um, and that they, they're currently quoting as that it will probably arrive no earlier than 2024. <laughs> But this will make Canada the fifth country in the world to get to curate a sample of material collected in space. Um, so it's been very, very exciting for everyone involved. And of course, the excitement will grow in 2024 when we actually get our, our little bit of, of however many grams was in there. Um, and uh, it's, it's been a wonderful mission all around, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the chemical analysis will be fascinating because one of the points behind this is they figure Bennu hasn't chemically undergone much change since the solar system formed. So they're wondering if this will give them some hints about sort of early earth chemistry, early earth formation, early life. Because it's like I said, it's, it's basically been frozen in time 
for four and a half billion years and what are you going to find on this thing i mean i think this is this is not by any means the only sort of chemical question they want to answer but it's one of those ones sort of always there that any time you pull a sample that's this old um what exactly are you going to find and what does it give us hints about the formation of the solar system and the start of life on earth and a whole bunch of other questions that that could come out of some of the analysis oh absolutely and it's i mean of course a lot of those questions are water-based as well as rock-based um, because we talk about the sample it being pulled off of this this rocky object but the big question for everyone is is how much water is Bennu actually made of if we got you know 250 grams of, of stuff how much of that would be would be water and how much is going to be um, rocky material and what might that tell us about about Bennu and then the early solar system because of course you know so we're trying to piece together our own beginnings here on earth why did earth get the water for or how yeah. where did we get water for our oceans um water is not uh easily um kept around this particular part of the solar system <laughs> especially yeah. early in the solar system uh it's thought that earth would have been very very hot and we probably would not have been able to retain much water in our early early formation so where did the water come from where, where the did the come air from? come from um and you know what's the source of the organic molecules that yeah. we know i mean they had, they, life had, on Earth? Had, they had some of the rosetta results a few years back and of course you had pile that landed and they yes. obviously didn't have sample return but they did get a good look at some of the water and they were actually found it wasn't consistent with what they had on earth which you know up until that time there was a lot of assumption around comets and asteroids providing the water earth and this kind of threw a whole spanner into the understanding and they didn't know was is just this one object or you know is does this actually mean that the water didn't come from comets yeah, and asteroids, if, if the so. water on earth didn't come from comets i mean if it did and then somehow it was processed to change enough maybe yeah. but um the, the and the, let's just make sure we tell everyone um so i believe we're both still talking about the mission stardust right um so this this was um you know the 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 mission um where we were trying to collect samples of a comet and return them to earth and yeah. again uh, um, comets are ancient bodies of frozen ice and dust uh and they they're expected to contain materials the solar system formed from um but the water as you say it didn't it didn't match um yeah and so this was comet wild two i believe is that yeah is that, that, was is that, that was the actual name <laughs> yeah i think that was the one so. yeah so that was wild too again astronomers are not great at naming things well um, no no well, well you can't blame them with comets because comets are named after their discoverer right oh well then someone yes, has that's, a cool name oh yeah that's why you get <laughs> things like temple tuttle and then tuttle temple and then the sort of leave and and that's why you'll have you know sometimes two or three comets will have similar names because it's the same person that's discovered them Right, so this would be Wild's second comet, then. Yeah. Um, but yeah, very, very exciting, um, very, very exciting mission. But it actually opened up, as I think, as many questions as it answered. Oh yeah. Um, it had, uh, um, you know, th this comet sample return, um, and that's uh, in 2009. They actually did find um, uh, one of the amino acids, um, but. Um, yeah, it's uh, it, it it is it is very very interesting stuff because if our if our comet sample return couldn't account for the water on Earth, can Bennu? And if not, then we still have a little bit of an unanswered question about how did Earth actually get its water? Um, and uh, um, you know, finding a, a water match with with Bennu would give some credit to the idea that earth could form without very much water or lose whatever water it had and then because of the early bombardment of the solar system that's a lot of impacts were happening early on in the solar system stuff was just getting hit left right and center 
uh, because there were so many things still around to to collide. <laughs> so if an early bombardment from asteroids could provide enough water to account for our oceans, that would make one mechanism for for oceans to exist. I mean, that said, Earth doesn't actually have all that much water. All well, things considered. I don't know. You have to be careful about that because um geologically what they have found is there's actually a lot more water trapped in the rock in earth's interior than they thought before oh re- more so than earth's this- oceans pardon more than earth's oceans then oh yeah so it's it's it when you actually look at earth's interior there's actually a lot of water in the interior like deep in not like wells or surface water like deep in um, and some of this comes out through volcanoes. Now they do think outgassing like that is a major source, but it was always hmm. a question of, was there actually that much water in Earth's interior? And it appears like recent studies have found there's a lot of water inside Earth. <laughs> so so different. Different. there's all of Earth's oceans and we have water on our insides, but we don't know how much. But <laughs> I will just say that um, compared to things like Europa and oh, Ganymede yeah. and Callisto, um, those are moons of, of Jupiter that we know have a huge amount of water um, by by mass. Um, and so, you know, looking at things in the icy outer solar system, you do get a lot more water than you would oh, yeah. here on Earth. But that said, if we do have more water um, underground and all of the water in our oceans, then we have even more to account for um, somehow. <laughs> I know. <laughs> what have we done? No, yeah. and it's 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 interesting to look at sort of the question of sort of comet and asteroid water because the problem is with comets is you don't know for sure where they come from. I mean, the sh- the short period ones are probably coming from the Kuiper Belt, but you don't know that for sure. And any long period ones, you know, you throw out because they would have originated around another star system probably or way out in the Oort cloud. So doesn't come into play but that's why Bennu might be interesting too because they think it formed in and around the asteroid belt which is kind of right on the edge of that ice line where you would have had more water so potentially it could I mean if it's that if the density is that low it's got to have a significant amount of water um, in order to be solid otherwise it would just be like gaseous almost or have a gas cover on it too Oh, yeah. Or uh, just a rubble pile, right? Yeah. Um, at some point. So a rubble pile is just a loose collection of rocks bound together by, by gravity. But Bennu, we know, is is somewhat, at least appears to be held together. Um, and the thing that would be holding it together at that low density almost has to be water. And as you mentioned, yeah. um, due to the frost line, which is a, always a handy reminder, if you haven't heard of the frost line in our solar system, if you go out past a certain distance, water um, stops becoming a uh, evaporated by the sun, basically. <laughs> um, so you get water behaving like a solid or an ice. And that happens, um, you know, once you get out um, I just passed the uh, the asteroid belt. So something like uh, 2.7 AU away from the sun. That is farther from the sun than Earth is. <laughs> so we have a lot more icy bodies out at, um, you know, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, of course. Um, and uh, we have Ceres in the asteroid belt, which appears to have an icy mantle. Um so we get a lot more icy things happening out past that distance because it's cold enough that ice can act like a solid and it doesn't just get blasted away by the sunlight or evaporated by yeah, the sun. Yeah, it's, it's, it just, it acts, it acts as rock basically yeah. out there. Yeah, the and especially it's a it's whole interesting chemistry when, when your water starts acting yeah. like rock. And it's like I said, you wonder with Bennu, um, if it did come from farther out, is part of the low density simply because some of this water has evaporated off? Like it has been in the inner solar system for some time, then the sunlight will be working on it to evaporate it off, similar to the way it does with a comet. Um, is that why it's kind of like low density? Because it was sort of a rock ice matrix and it's a lot of the water has actually been evaporated 
away at some point. I mean, that's that's kind yeah. Of well, that's that's but... what we're what we're gonna find out is because if they don't yeah. find water in Bennu, um, then it, and then we have more questions because is it because there was no water there or is it because the water has evaporated? Because we we took a sample with Osiris Rex. And there's lovely pictures of the sample site and touchdown, but it's just touched the surface, right? So they just barely go on the surface and they grab some rocks and they ran back off because they, they can't land there and dig into it, right? No, once um, you dig in, you're stuck. <laughs> yeah, you're stuck there. And you know, you'd need a drill and it would be a whole different, a whole different thing. So we've only got a sample just from the surface, which is exactly where water ice would dissipate um as you say it, it comes yeah. quite close to earth it's it's inside um the ice line so it's it's not in a safe position for an icy body <laughs> no it should it should be melting um, away i mean that's exactly what happens with comets they come you know when they hit yeah. that distance they start to melt and some of yeah that and, and it is interesting because of course this actually ties in to bennu as an active asteroid sporadically emits plumes of particles and rocks not dust rocks as large as 10 centimeters it's it's sort of shedding outer layers of rocks uh consistently and this is a a feature of Bennu um that we've known about and it makes it really really interesting so I suppose that if you like mysteries there is quite <laughs> a lot to enjoy here all right, so I suppose we should probably wrap up for this evening. Um, do you have any final Bennu notes? Mm, I just listening eagerly over the next few years to see some of what comes out about Bennu. It's like I said, I think there's a lot of interesting chemistry, especially potentially as relates to the being of life on Earth that, you know, may be coming out over the next few years as they analyze those samples. Excellent. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for joining me this evening. And to everyone listening, uh, thank you as well for tuning in tonight. You have been listening to York Universe, the astronomy and astrophysics program written and presented by students, faculty, alumni, and friends of York University. The hosts this evening have been Professor Mary Helen Armour and myself, uh, Dr. Elena Hyde. This is our astronomy.fm partner broadcast on YouTube for tonight. You can always connect with us on Twitter with a handle at York Universe or at um, Ellen, or sorry, York U, U Observatory, <laughs> and um, Instagram at York U Observatory, and Facebook at Ellen Iker as well, OBS. So all the connectivity. Stay uh, up to date with uh, show notes and content and tour tickets at yorku.ca slash science slash observatory. Thanks for tuning in to York Universe. Clear skies, everyone, and have a good night. <laughs>